the shooting range. In this episode, Wilhelm Heidkamp, a person, but also a boat. The story of the Z-21 destroyer, the northern port, a new location for out map guide section. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with Chieftain Marksman, the new top-tier SPAAG for the British Tech Tree. With the arrival of the 1.79 Project X update, fans of the British machines finally got their hands on the top AA gun, the Chieftain Marksman. This bad boy has a battle rating of 8.0 and boasts two 35mm Ehrlichan KDA cannons. These guns will be pretty familiar to anyone who owns machines like the Type 87 and the Flakpanzer 1 Gepard. However, our guest significantly differs from its brethren. This self-propelled AA gun is based on the Chieftain Mark V tank, which means we can immediately wave bye-bye to high-speed movement. 35 km per hour on rough terrain in realistic battles and 44 kph in arcade. Couple that with almost non-existent armor and a great silhouette and all of that leads to a conclusion that the Chieftain Marksman is practically useless against enemy tanks. Well, yeah, the dual Ehrlichan KDA can still do some harm at point-blank range, but you'll waste all 40 of your armor-piercing shells before you can say Chieftain Marksman out loud. No, sir. Only airborne targets for you. And here goes another disappointment. You see, the maximum ammunition load of this vehicle is just 500 units, including the aforementioned 40 armor-piercing shells. It's a criminally tight bottleneck for an AA gun with such a high rate of fire. You can say that for sure, and you'll be wrong. In reality, the clue for how to play the Chieftain Marksman correctly is in the name. Be a Marksman. A sharpshooter. Forget about firing in long bursts or suppressing your enemy with hundreds of shells. Your true calling is setting sights on a target, carefully aiming, and taking it down with one precise short burst. It's entirely possible to take down four or five enemy planes in one battle without running out of ammunition. You'll also get some help from the radar installed on the turret. It would be a nightmare without it in realistic battles. Although if the enemy pilots are smart enough to evade your fire until you're empty, don't just call it quits. Mosey on over to any captured point, replenish your ammo, and voila! You can return to your duty as if nothing ever happened. The Chieftain Marksman is as good at its job as any of its competitors. Why exactly? It's obvious. Just look at the turret rotation speed, 90 degrees per second, and the vertical guidance from minus 10 degrees to plus 85 degrees, you can home in on your target in seconds. Now is time for some tactical advice. When piloting the Chieftain Marksman, your main objective is denying the enemy aviation any breathing room and defending the points so we strongly encourage you to stay near captured points. That way, you'll be able to replenish ammo in a pinch and stop an enemy advance. You really shouldn't rush ahead of your team. If there's no one between you and your adversaries, it's better to fall back. The thick smoke screen and those 40 armor-piercing shells will help with that. You won't necessarily kill anyone, but you're more than capable of destroying the turret or a track, even if shooting head-on. And of course, don't forget about the airspace control. In realistic battles, the only help here is your ears. So boost the volume in your headphones. And in arcade battles, you of course receive some information on the events in the sky. Don't let your guard down even for a moment, or your allies will likely be done. And now let's go to Germany, 
and remember the story of a great warship. The German Type 1936 destroyers were the last machines of this kind to receive unique names. They were honoring the heroes of World War I. The Z-21, the sixth warship of the line, bore the name of Obermatt Wilhelm Heidkamp. This fellow wasn't a high-ranking army official. He became famous on January the 15th, 1915, in the Battle of Dogger Bank. Wilhelm served as a machinist on the German battlecruiser Zeitlitz when the British Lion shot the ship's turret. The hit killed 160 sailors in one fell swoop and caused fire in the under turret compartment. The flames quickly spread onto the gunpowder stash and the shell storage. It could have blown up any second, taking the whole ship down. Just moments before the catastrophe, Obermatt Heidkamp grabbed the red-hot emergency flooding valves and, with some kind of inhuman strength, all by himself, opened them. The flood put out the flames. Wilhelm Heidkamp saved both the ship and hundreds of sailors. This feat cost him a near-fatal burn. He scorched his hands to the bone. The hero of Zeidlitz didn't make it to World War II. His old wounds got the best of him in 1931. In 1939, the brand new Kriegsmarine destroyer, named in his honor, began its duty. At the start of World War II, those ships played the role of mine layers. The German command strived to isolate the water area around the British Isles, cutting Great Britain off from the outside world. On the night of October 17, 1939, the destroyer Wilhelm Heidkamp participated in setting up the minefields for the first time. This was a big deal. Why? Well, two things. First, Wilhelm Heidkamp was a flagship leading the squadron. Second, Rear Admiral Gunther Lutjens led the operation. Yes, that Lutjens, soon to be captain of the legendary Bismarck and Prince Eugen. The October 17 operation was a success. The Brits were so unprepared to deal with the German aggression that they just <laughs> forgot to turn off their lighthouses, which kindly illuminated the way for the Wilhelm Heidkamp and its allies. During the next few months, the ship basically did the same thing a couple of more times. It laid mines in the Thames Estuary too. But of course, this destroyer didn't limit itself to just diversions. In April of 1940, the German command appointed the Heidkamp as the flagship to lead the invasion of Norway. The squadron's first target was the city of Narvik. The fleet was to approach the harbor and drop off the troops. But at daybreak of April 9, just as the fleet was about to reach its objective, the Norwegian ironclad warships Eideswul and the Norg stood in the fleet's way. The German officer requested immediate surrender from the Eideswul, but the Norwegian captain answered shortly, I will attack. Well, the Hyde camp was ready to go in, guns blazing, so it tore the Eideswul apart with torpedoes. The Norg tried to return fire, but was too slow, and the German destroyers disposed of it quickly. With nothing in their way, the troops took Narvik within an hour. The Heidkamp had an order to return to Germany after the city was captured, but the ship was stalled due to refilling. Its fuel boilers didn't just malfunction constantly, but also burnt the fuel in really unhealthy amounts. Alas, this one night of meddling turned out to be a huge mistake. In the morning, the British fleet approached the harbor. The destroyers Hardy, Hunter, and Havoc, cloaked by the dawning mist, unleashed 20 torpedoes on stationary targets. Heidkamp sustained fatal damage at 5.30 a.m. Ironically, the ammo explosion brought the ship down. This time, 
there was no one brave enough to flood the shell storage in a very dangerous situation. The destroyer slowly sank and never returned. Capitan Friedrich Bunter and all the squadron's command went down with it. Out of all the Type 1936 destroyers, only the Z-20 Karl Galster survived the massacre at Narvik. Everybody else found their graves in Norwegian waters. And now let's check out one of the new naval maps. This map has stored something special for everyone. In theory, the forces here are distributed like this. Smaller ships fight for the Alpha Point and Bravo and Charlie are for the destroyers and the cruisers to take. But in reality, of course, nobody forbids a bigger ship to fight for the center and a smaller one to test its luck in outer waters. Point Alpha is very open. There's nowhere to hide here. The only way to dodge the enemy fire is to cover yourself with a smoke screen. But even then, don't forget about the enemy torpedoes. As for the approaches to the point, there are plenty of those, as it is girded by a group of isles separating this sector from the open waters. They are flooded with enemy boats and occasionally a bigger fish comes here to hunt. But that's a difficult spot for big ships as they need to control too many directions at once. In the lower part of the map, we find Point Charlie. This one is where the big ones can have some fun. There's plenty of space for any kind of maneuvers, as the shore is only on one side of this area, and the rest is just blue water. Though in the center of this part of the map, we can see an island that will come in handy for those who want to escape enemy fire. And next to it, there's another piece of land which is great for those moments when you want to flank instead of rushing forward. Lastly, on the north side, there is the Bravo capture point. Here, you'll need to fight in a narrow space between some isles and some icebergs. There's not a lot of place to maneuver, and you'll also find yourself constantly accompanied by the enemy torpedo boats, as the respawn point for the smaller ships is quite close to this area. That means that if you want to capture the point, you certainly need to command your gunners to shoot naval targets. And what if you are the captain of a smaller boat? The best choice is to wait for some really tasty and big fish and ambush it before its captain realizes anything. Definitely not the wisest option here is capturing the point yourself. It's very open and you won't last longer than one enemy blast. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question was asked by a user called John Berkey. Battleships? But you can add battleships if you want. Uh, we meant destroyers, sorry about that. No battleships for now. Random guy using glasses asks, Will you make an episode about Object 120, Taran? Hi there, mate. We already did that once. Check episode 61 for that. As for the story of this machine, We'll see what we can do. Then, there's a question from a user called Medic, the Doctor. In early episodes, you talked about Dutch planes, so when are they coming? Hi, Doc. We still can't confirm anything on those Dutch planes. Not this year, that's for sure. Another question today is sent by a whole lot of people who don't seem to watch our show very often, and every one of them wants the BT-42. Well, we're still not adding the BT-42 anytime soon. We like girls und Panzer, too, but this totally isn't our first priority at the moment. And the last, 
very serious message was sent by a player called Tamidur Rahman. I wish it was Gaijin World Cup, then Russia would always win. So that's what they needed, huh? We'll call FIFA right now, see if they would share the rights for the next World Cup. Well, that's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range. <laughs>